bunch of fish with black dots all over them. And it's actually caused by a tree metode. Um, this tree metode is usually utilizes three different hosts, um, a bird, a fish, and a snail. Um, but what I've been looking at is how this infection is possibly impacting the health of the black nose bees who reach up um, to the So originally we had thought that what we were seeing was tubular amblyopitis. There are multiple um, species that can cause this type of infection. Um, but after speaking with a few other fish pathologists, what we think we're seeing now is actually um, from the Neastis genus, but we're working towards a positive ID. Um, either way though, they usually utilize a similar life cycle. So a kingfisher will ingest an infected fish um, within the kingfisher, the eggs of the tree toad are laid. Um, they're expelled from the kingfisher into the stream where they hatch and then infect the snail host. The snail then, they swim the snail and then they um, return to their pre-swimming form. The sertaria actually embed on this, um, into the musculature, usually black nose days or creature up in this. So here are just some pictures from the field of so a lot of the reason why we chose to study this has to do with previous years. Um, in 2011, a few fish in Big Stream and Rock Stream on the west side of the lake uh, were observed having this infection, but with very long run. Um, in 2012, when we set out to do a community a fish community survey around all of these streams, we ended up finding the infection in increased uh, abundance in Pasham Creek, Big Stream, Rock Stream, Reader Creek, and Mill Creek. So it spread from just the west side to the eastern side as well. So in 2013, um, we went back to these Red Star sites from 2012 to do our study. So our main objectives were to look at how this infection was possibly affecting the health of the fish as well as to where the tree toad itself was existing most frequently. So we had hypothesized that infection prevalence would vary between our five stream sites, that black spot infected fish would have a lower body condition compared to non-infected fish, um, and that this body condition would change between June and July, uh, the early June and late July. I mean, I'm sorry, early June and late June. Um, and that fish with a higher abundance of cysts would experience a decreased body also, from uh, previous field seasons, we noted that cysts were occurring in clumps, so we, this led us to believe that infection um, was not random, that there were certain areas the parasite was infected more frequently than others. And we also hypothesized that internal infection was occurring. So we went about testing uh, this by electrofishing. Um, we electrofished two dates, early June and late June. Um, at each of our five sites, and we walked off 75 meter stretch at each of our sites and did double pass electric fishing on um, both of them. Um, from our collected fish, uh, we measured length and weight, which we later used to calculate Fulton's pay value for body condition. Um, we also took a picture of the left side of all of our infected fish to later um, calculate the abundance of cysts we were seeing on each of our fish. Um, we also were able to bring back a few fish to the lab for exploratory dissection. Um, as I said earlier, we primarily focused on black nose days and creek trout because these were the two species we were seeing infection in most commonly. So, um, to address our first question, do some streams have higher prevalence of infection than others? Um, here we're defining prevalence as the percentage of infected fish within each of these, within the total um, So on the x-axis, you have our stream sites, y, you have our prevalence, and then the black bars are, are representative of the lack of fishing we did in early June, and the white bars in late June. So more than anything, what I want you to take out of this slide is the variability between our stream sites in infection prevalence. Because of this, we thought we might have an issue of multicollinearity, which ended up being the case, uh, we performed a chi-square contingency analysis, which resulted in um, us 
pointing out that student infection status will not be dependent on one another. So this was important for our following two questions. Um, we ended up performing a mixed model um, with a fixed effect of infection and a random effect of stream. Um, and what we ended up finding was that our our infected fish were actually longer than our non infected fish, which wasn't exactly what we had thought we would be getting out of this. But we also asked the question as to whether infected fish were leaner than our non infected fish, and our infected fish were in fact heavier across both species on both left and fish species. So then we used the data that we had collected um, in the field and making link data to calculate Fulton's K value, which is a measure of body condition. And we ended up finding out that there was no statistical difference between infected and non-infected uh, fish, except for in the creek chub that we collected in Lake June. Um, these creek chub were actually, their body condition was lower, the infected creek chub, than our non So using the photo analysis that I talked about earlier, we were able to calculate the total number of cysts on the left side of our infected fish which is our total cyst abundance, and we were able to compare that data to our length and weight. And what we ended up finding was a significant relationship between total cyst abundance and length and black nose days, as well as total cyst abundance and weight and black nose days. So we then combined this total cyst abundance with the body condition that we had calculated, and we ended up finding there was no significant relationship between body condition and We then decided to take this a step further. Um, I read a really interesting paper by Raw Waiting and Staken from 1980 where they had taken their infected black nose days and actually dissected them into six sections to determine where insistment was incurred and most frequently. Now, in their paper, they actually cut the fish into six separate sections, but we decided to use the photos we'd taken to um, split the fish into three different or six different sections. Um, and so what we ended up finding was that uh, in the medial ventral portion, so section four, insistent was occurring most frequently. And this was true of both black and chub. So then because of how, how severe the infection we were seeing was, um, we had started to think that there was a possibility of internal infection occurring. So what you're seeing here is a cyst dissected out of one of our fish. Um, within the mouth of a creek chub here as well. And then this is actually tissue that was taken from um, in between the rib cage of one of our fish, and there are cysts on it too. So how we went about um, determining if there was some type of internal infection occurring was we used our explore, we used exploratory dissections. We opened up the fish, checked all internal organs, and then looked in um, some other places the mouth, the ear, genital opening, um, and the gill cavity um, to determine if there was an infection in the fish there. Um, what we ended up finding was out of all the fish we collected and performed this exploratory dissection on, that uh, insistent was occurring most frequently, in these fish at least, in the internal operculum or within the gill cavity itself, uh, as well as in the mouth. And so I have some really quick pictures. Well, I of, um, of this, <laughs> but um, so this is the urogenital opening of one of our fish, and there's a cyst in there. And then here you're looking at an eye of a black nose day to be collected. So here the eye was removed, and there's a cyst right in the eye socket behind where the eye was. Um, here, two other cysts surrounding the eye, as well as here. Um, so here, we're looking at the gill and the operculum. So there's the gill right there. We pulled back the operculum and there were three cysts right here embedded on the inside of the operculum. Then here's a cyst that actually is in the gill tissue. Uh, one of our black mistakes. So from our studies, we concluded that larger fish are more frequently parasitized than smaller fish. Um, that there does not appear to be a relationship between cyst abundance and body condition, um, and that insistence is not random, it's taking place most frequently in the medial ventral region of the fish. And we 
also determined that the parasite was found internally, but doesn't seem that the infection is reproducing the parasite fish. Um, so some future directions. Uh, we were actually able to collect underwater video footage in a parasitized and non-parasitized stream this summer. And we haven't actually looked at the video yet, but we're hoping to analyze that and determine if there are different behaviors occurring between parasitized and non-parasitized fish. Um, we also took a bunch of water quality, uh, water samples, which I did some water quality analyses on to try and determine if there's a relationship between uh, nutrients and infection prevalence. And while we got some interesting results, it definitely pointed to the need for a more intensive uh, we also collected scales this summer for our infected and non-infected fish, um, and we were hoping to analyze that data to determine if there was some relationship between age and um, infection. So I'd like to thank the FLI Endowment and the New York State DOS um, for funding my research. Uh, my advisor, Susan Cushman, as well as the other HWS biology faculty who helped me, so Professor Bradley Cosentino, Jim Ryan, I'd also like to thank my field assistants, Sarah Buckleitner and Jordan Youngman, as well as my honors committee, which consisted of Megan Brown, Neil Ringler, and Professor Sean Connery. Um, I'd also like to thank my advisor, son Riley, for all of his help in the field this summer, too. So, anyone have any questions?